Good day to all those of you that have joined us for this Tiger Brands and Mail and Guardian webinar. My name is Kathy Moshasha and I'm going to be your facilitator for this conversation throughout the day. The theme we are exploring today, of course, is a very important one. Why food is an urgent rights issue for children during a crisis. And it couldn't have come at a better time. We're dealing with a society that in many ways is still recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the issues that we know is that we're not dealing with just increasing levels of unemployment, but it's been incredibly difficult for millions of South African households to put food on the table. So what does this reality mean for the children of this country? And what are some of the solutions that we can think about today that can make us better prepared for future crises that could well result in the same type of decisions that have resulted in lockdowns, have made it people for be, to be able to earn a living. But certainly we have to make sure that we're cushioning those who are the most vulnerable in our society. So when disaster strikes, issues of food security become central to managing the crisis. And again, as I was talking about those recent events globally, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us exactly how vulnerable children have become and can be during a time of crisis. Now, future emergencies are likely to come even if their exact nature cannot always be predicted. So how do we build on what we have learned so far. Let me introduce the guests that are going to be part of uh, the panel this afternoon who will be sharing their insights and knowledge on the subject. Uh, Dr. Fraser Mulegedi, Ambassador Sheila Sisulu, and Ms. Konehadi Gugushe. They're going to be sharing some of the knowledge that they have and, of course, also just responding to the problem statement that we have. You, as our delegates, will have an opportunity to ask your questions uh, for our panelists. If you uh, see just on the right of your screen, the different tabs that are available there. So if you have uh, questions, you can pop them through the chat group. Any comments, you can also pop them through the chat group. You'll also see on the side there that we've got uh, a segment called polls, and uh, there will be a number of polls that we are running throughout the conversation. So just keep an eye on it and cast your vote when you have the opportunity to do so. Without wasting any further time, I'm going to invite the panelists to come on and just give us the opening remarks for this conversation. And much of it will, of course, be about why it's important for us to have this conversation about food as a critical rights issue. Dr. Geraldine Fraser Mulegeti, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and thank you, Cathy, and to my fellow panelists and to all those who are watching this afternoon or listening in. This particular issue of uh, uh, food security, um, food nutrition, the whole issue of hunger and child hunger is quite a critical issue. Because we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has severely exacerbated child hunger and malnutrition globally, including in South Africa, obviously, as you pointed out, where millions of households, and this is in South Africa, have reportedly run out of money to buy food during the hard lockdown last year in 2020. When we look at the National Income Dynamics Study that was commissioned in April um, and May this year, there were 2.3 million respondents and uh, from 2.3 million households actually, and they reported child hunger in the week before they were interviewed. And of those 2.3 million households, around six, 620,000 reported that a child had experienced hunger almost every day or every day the week before they were interviewed. There was also some work that was done by the South African Medical Research Council by Wange Zembe, Zembe Mkabele. And she said uh, that the situation is a reflection on society as a whole. 
And we know that we are a society with great income inequality, high unemployment levels, but it also shows that a food system that doesn't, and I'm quoting, that doesn't grow enough food to sustain the entire population of this country, it actually it does grow more than enough food to sustain the entire population of our country, but it fails to reach the poor. And this reflects persistently high levels of inequality, which has only worsened with COVID-19, close quotes. I don't think I need to say more on why this is such a critical issue and why this is a rights issue as well. And I'm sure my fellow panelists will add to this because we know, and yet I'd also want to quote, that child hunger can contribute towards stunting and stunting has a deleterious impact on child development and the entire life course of a child. With stunted children, we see higher odds of poor growth, poor cognitive development, poor educational outcomes, and lower income productivity later in life, close quotes. If we want a South Africa, that's one that's got the growth trajectory that will take us into a, the future, we must deal with the issue of child nutrition. We've got to eliminate child hunger. Back to you, Cathy. Thank you so much uh, for that, Dr. Fraser uh, Mulligetti. And of course, uh, I forgot to mention the titles of our guests earlier, as as I was introducing you, as uh, as I was introducing them. Of course, uh, Dr. Geraldine Fraser Mulligetti is the chair. I won't say chairman, but maybe the chairwoman of uh, Tiger Brands. Uh, Ambassador Sheila Sisulu is uh, the Tiger Brands Foundation chair, and of course, um, our third guest, Ms. Konehadi Gugu is the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. So, Ambassador uh, Sisulu, I'll hand over to you next just to at least set the context from your perspective on the subjects that we're grappling with today. Oh, thank you very much, Kathy, and uh, good afternoon to everyone present. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that we, we're having this conversation. Uh, I don't want to say finally, uh, but we've all known it's, it's that uh, children in South Africa suffer hunger. 25% of them are malnourished. The fact that we have uh, introduced programs uh, such as the school uh, nutrition program, in school nutrition program, by the education department feeding nine million uh, children uh, per day um, is testament to the fact that we knew that there was something wrong with the food system in south africa but i must hasten to say that the the un this year has been looking at uh, global food systems because that system is broken. Any uh, emergency, any crisis causes it to fall apart uh, globally. And, and COVID was no different. Uh, the financial crisis of 2008, if uh, some of you um, are old enough, um, also had a knock-on effect on food distribution uh, because it works in a global system. And so you had food riots in some countries, including Senegal, uh, Egypt, um, and Pakistan. Governments closed their borders uh, to keep their wheat or whatever it is that they were exporting inside their countries, inside their borders, which the global food system allows. Now, if we come to, to South Africa, unfortunately, uh, our, our system works on the basis only of production to fill up the silos. And if you want even to fill up the, 
the supermarkets. But that is a national figure. When it comes to household, access and affordability of quality food is a serious problem. And I think COVID showed us that very quickly. So if, as we go on, uh, I, I will, I will uh, talk about what's possible. But I'd like to emphasize that we knew this. It's the food system that's uh, how we understand or apply food security in South Africa. We have a global national fig a number that doesn't include households. So, and in those households, there are children. So I will keep repeating this point that children are not hungry alone. They are not hungry separately from their families. So whatever we put in place needs to take that into account. Thank you. Ambassador Sisulu, thank you so much for that contribution. And the point that you're making there, the final point that you're making is a very important one, you know, that these children come from families. And if they are unable to get food from their families, what does it stay, say about the state of the family and perhaps even the broader community? So up next, let me invite then Ms. Konehadi, Konehadi rather, Gugushe, uh, who is with the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. Thank you very much, Kathy, and good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon to my fellow panelists. Well, first, let me say thank you to Tiger Brands and the Mail and Guardian for arranging this very important discussion. And perhaps, uh, you know, they say hindsight is um, is 2020 or perfect science, because I think um, COVID-19 really showed us gaps that exist within uh, all our systems. COVID-19 was a global uh, had a global impact, uh, but particularly in South Africa, one of the very stark effects that was seen was that of hunger. Uh, people uh, during the hard lockdown who suddenly did not have access to food, and particularly those members of our society that depend on social systems and social safety nets to provide them with access to food. So when schools were closed, and children could not get to the schools for the feeding programs and um, some of the drop-in centers and so on, we really saw um, the impact of how our system is just not ready to provide that safety net in a sustainable manner. Now, um, over that kind of uh, period, what we experienced on the ground um, was also that sometimes the system is also affected by how we respond to it. And so, um, you know, while the responses were very much uh, towards the control and stemming of the COVID-19 spread, um, it did not enable um, families and communities to be able to provide for themselves. It, actu it actually provided constraints um, because we saw these rules that were being put on where people could not move around freely, could not get access uh, to certain things. And when we do that, we really, again, you know, just expand this divide of those people who have access and easy access towards um, food and, and other enablements. And, um, you know, those vulnerable members of our society just don't have any, any help and any access. So it's very important for us to examine um, and and once we've passed through this period to see what can we improve, what, are, what lessons have we learned so that we can be able to set ourselves up better for the future. What we know is that the world is always going to have crisis after crisis. We saw COVID-19 do that. We saw um, the riots in July also affecting supply chains and so on. So there will be impacts that constrain our ability to get access um, to food. So for us, it's also then 
to see how do we enable communities to provide for themselves so that they don't always co depend on some of these safety nets that do get um, get set up. So I'm very excited and very glad to be part of this discussion. I really think that it's very timely. And um, I think that it's something that should be elevated because the impacts of it can really be far reaching. Mm -hmm. I, I want to uh, build on, on the conversation here and, and perhaps uh, go back to Dr. Fraser Mulligeti. You know, one of the things that we ended up with was a situation where children in schools did not have access to food because their, their schools were shut down. And so the, nutri the nutrition program for a couple of months was at a complete standstill. And the decision to shut down schools and not provide food, that really comes down to issues of planning, right, um, Dr. Mulligeti? So are we well prepared? Do we have mechanisms and tools that are able to say, what do we do in times of, of crisis? What are the things that we need to prioritize in, in a time of crisis? So a crisis is obviously, obviously exactly what it says. It's a crisis. But we've seen multiple crises over the past 10 years globally as well as locally. And uh, Ambassador Sisulu has actually spoken to one where she spoke about the global financial crisis. But let's talk about COVID and, and to a degree, the recent unfortunate uh, unrest that we had seen in parts of our country, specifically two provinces. I think both instances very clearly showed our inability or, or, or let's say, yeah, our inability to really kick in and respond in a coordinated manner in handling the crisis. Because as was pointed out uh, by our earlier fellow panelist, where she said, so kids who had uh, access nutrition at schools, and mind you, Tiger Brands provides meals at uh, 105 schools across the country. Those kids were not accessible. Uh, um, or not that the kids were not accessible. Our systems could not, did not access them. So it points to any conflict and the fact that when you have a conflict, you need to ensure that you have the kind of policies and systems to handle this. And these interventions require interface both from government, the public sector, as well as the private sector and civil society at large. I've got to applaud the fact that civil society did come in as government tried to come in and find their footing. But what they didn't, uh, what we never really pulled uh, together was the fact that, you know, your health system is almost quite central in all this, because just think back over the past uh, year plus, we've seen that the numbers of children in their first 100 days who presented at clinics, those numbers dropped. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at nutrition of kids, stunting, if you want to pick up issues around uh, child hunger and household hunger, you pick it up in the clinics. So that access was not there. Secondly, because schools were closed, the links with the education system wasn't there. Because again, um, very clearly, both if you look at the Department of Basic Education and the Department of Social Development through SASA, they also know who the most vulnerable kids are. They know that from the database, the SASA database, as they would know it from the education database. I mean, most obviously, the kids who are most at risk should be sitting at the front in the class. So it's how do you bring these systems together to actually get them to function in concert? And I think that's where the breakdown was. That's where the rub was missing. And I think we need to look at how we deal with it. It's the same in conflict uh, settings where you have a breakdown between different settings and we need to look at better coordination 
And it's not just policy and planning. It's also the actual mechanics of how it works and how the private sector comes together, coordinated to make it happen. Let me pause there. Ambassador Susulu, you, you spoke down about, you spoke a lot about the collapse of international food systems, that this situation was not unique to South Africa. What is it that particularly makes it difficult during these times of crisis to reach children, especially we've just heard um, from, from Dr. Geraldine, who says, well, you know, we are part of those that feed children, but systems made it difficult for us to, to find these children where they were. Um, yes, I, I, I think um, I will say our systems, especially for, for reaching children or other values, um, were best on sunny days. But uh, when there's rain, uh, a little rain becomes a problem. And COVID was a storm, not a little rain. So uh, the systems just broke down. Now, the, the world food system operates on markets being in one place and producers and exporters being another place. If you take, if you take South Africa or the continent. Uh, we export to Europe and other continents. We import from those continents. So once there were no flights, there were no ships, um, the roads were closed. Even if they said for emergencies, the trucks will move. Um, that immediately was a storm and the, the world food system uh, fell apart as well. But I think in our case in South Africa, um, our, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Geraldine uh, has been saying repeatedly coordination and coordination for emergencies. Uh, you operate on when there's a storm. But you need to know when there's going to be a storm. It's not a, it's not record science. Yes, it was COVID and um, we could not be as prepared. But in order to be prepared, you need to be able uh, to read the signs. For example, if there's country A and there's a, a war in that country and people are invariably going to move from country A to country B in hundreds of thousands of numbers, uh, you know that's going to happen. So you position the food or assistance where people are going to end up because you can't get into a war zone. So what we need in South Africa is anyone warning prepared system. The early warning will tell us, for example, that now we are facing a climate crisis. And in South Africa, it's showing itself up in a shortage of water and if there's no water there's no food so you do the calculation and you know once we are told that there's this system coming and we're going to have a drought and then you know where do we position the food for those who are vulnerable so an early warning and preparedness system is essential for getting ready for any eventuality. The, the second issue about uh, children could not access food. Uh, I, I have to say, we at Ben's where Foundation were in a way uh, out of the blocks uh, very fast. 
because we have a system of food parcels during the holidays. Uh, it's because these children are not hungry only when they come to class. They are hungry all the time. So we have a system where we provide them with food parcels during the holidays. The difference between us and uh, the department who is a great partner for us, it, for that to happen, Oh, uh, apologies. It looks like we've lost Ambassador uh, Sisulu there. I know that her connection is giving us uh, a bit of trouble this afternoon. So please, uh, for all of those that have joined the webinar, please do bear with us. We will try and get her back up on the platform as soon as we can. Uh, Kone, let me come to you. Um, you know, there seem to have been a level of denialism around the need to provide food for children during the crisis. And mm. Uh, Dr. Geraldine talks about the fact that we have all of these different state entities that should have known uh, where these children were, especially those that, uh, you know, were, are in most, in, in, that, that have the greatest need and, and therefore would have been the priority. But it, it seems that that wasn't necessarily the case. What are the, what are the mechanisms that need to be put in place to ensure that when the next crisis hit, hits, we don't have civil society taking government to court to force them to provide meals for children. Yes, indeed, Kathy. I mean, I think, um, as, as, as earlier said, a crisis is just that, you know, it's unanticipated. You are uh, most probably ill prepared for it. Um, but what becomes important is um, how in your response you are able to cater um, for a multidisciplinary approach. And I think what we saw with uh, the response to COVID was a very much heavy response focused on the health aspects and um, all the other, uh, you know, um, knock-on knock -on effects um, seemed to come a little bit as an as a, as a, as a afterthought. However, when you do have, uh, you know, multidisciplinary approach, uh, whether in um, civil society and government, in an approach that uh, allows, um, you know, planning together and working together of various disciplines, then you can be able to have a more holistic um, approach. I want to echo uh, the, the, the comments from uh, Ambassador Sisulu, when she was saying that Tiger Brands uh, was a, a bit quick out of the blocks in responding and assisting in the crisis, because from our perspective, we also were um, able to call upon them uh, as a partner to get us to distribute food to those to those communities that we work in. And Tiger Brands was one of the corporates that was ready. Um, with with the response um, um, towards that, and it was very valuable. You know, some people came with uh, food vouchers, but the food vouchers still required someone to actually have a permit to go and buy the food. Whereas Tiger Brands, you know, was ready with with the food. Now, um, how how we can improve this um, going forward? One of the things that we saw uh, as a drawback, firstly, is that. Some, some civil society organizations or, and some donors that provide funding actually um, are very, were very strict in terms of the criteria of what they were funding and therefore not able to be responsive to an immediate crisis that was happening. So people had to take time to redirect the funding that was available for certain things, certain organizations that worked with particular focus areas had to take time to respond to a crisis that was unfolding in front of us. So we do need in how we structure ourselves now as um, you know, civil society and organizations that work, that work as part of the safety net um, for vulnerable communities. When we structure ourselves, we need to leave a little bit of room for that unanticipated um, developments so that we can be able to be agile in response, so that we can be able to redirect funding 
um, where and when required. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Kone. Uh, to, to our participants, if you just click on the poll on uh, the side of the screen, you'll see that we're running uh, the first poll for the day. And in fact, uh, I believe that uh, the results for that one have already come out. Of course, we're asking you, did you know that research indicates that poorly nourished children are vulnerable to poor health and deficiencies affecting learning? We'll bring you some of uh, those results towards the end of the webinar. Uh, Dr. M uh, Geraldine, let me come back to you. Um, Gwone talked about the av availability of Tiger Brands. And uh, I see that we've also got one extra delegate there with Yes, you. we've got an extra <laughs> delegate. She's been as her parents uh, did when they were small. In all my <laughs> meetings, they joined me. So this was always real. And uh, I always joked and said, if we did debriefing of those kids, they would have been able to tell stories about what their parents were involved in those years. <laughs> No, no, no. Well, now she can talk about child, child nutrition <laughs> and the fact that the fact uh, around uh, children having the right to nutrition in Section 28.1 uh, of the Constitution, she will mm -hmm. have to make sure that it becomes a living reality. You know? <laughs> Her responsibility. You, you, yeah. you start them young. You start them yes. young. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just wanted you to build on, on Connie's point on, on the role of businesses and their agility to respond in times of crises. And, and you know, what, what is really the, the role and the burden for businesses during these times of crises when we're watching communities, uh, you know, go through such difficulties? I think the f uh, first issue is that as a business, we should not see it as a burden because at the end of the day, we are the largest uh, uh, food company on the African continent. That's the first thing. The second thing, if you look at the work that has been done both by the foundation as well as Mary Jane Murifi in with respect to our ESD and other work, we've always been quite clear that we have a greater responsibility. So we haven't seen it as one of those things that are nice to have. And you'd see that as well um, through a recent study that Tiger Brands has commissioned around the state of nutrition in South Africa. It's, it's actually the second study, but I think that shows our commitment. So I think to business as a whole, in times of crisis, this is when business and citizens come together and say, we need to look at how best we can contribute from each of our sectors to make a difference. Mm -hmm. With us, it's from the perspective of food and nutrition. We can look at our supply chains and see how we can improve that what we do to walk the extra mile. And we were reminded by Ambassador Susulu that hunger is not restricted to children. But the one point that I would like to emphasize, and it's a point that I made earlier, is that much as children are not the only ones, they are the most severely affected. And I've spoken about the long-term effects of it. The second point I'd want to make again, addressing the private sector, when you look, for example, at the IT sector, and the IT sectors have done well during this time, they should look at their collaboration with the Department of Education to make sure that kids also have access to education. It again goes back to the point I made around coordination the need to have a seamless link across. So no one should say, my mandate starts here and ends here. It's looking at the virtuous circle and how we contribute towards making a difference. Thank you and over to you. And it's it's an important point that you're raising there. And I want you just to stay with it. I see here in the comments group, uh, and it's a comment that, that was made by uh, Shahida Omar. And, and she's talking about how there seemed to have been a lack of 
collaboration between uh, the private sector, civil society, in, coordi in coordinating efforts to respond to the crisis at hand. Are there ways to build those relationships now so that when the next crisis comes, everybody understands that the ringing of the panic button automatically sets into place some form of protocols or standard output pr procedures uh, that, need, that need to be followed? So, yes, and I, I don't even think it's post-crisis. We even mm -hmm. started grappling with this during the crisis. And mind you, we're not through COVID yet. So mm -hmm. to a large extent, we're looking at the systems for what we should call the new normal. And the new normal should say that the public sector cannot operate in the way in which it has in the past. This is a moment where everybody says, galvanize, reorganize, coordinate, and collaborate across yourself, across one. The second issue is that we have been in collaboration with uh, civil society. And we've heard earlier the Nelson Mandela uh, Foundation and uh, uh, Children's Fund Hospital, there's collaboration there. But around uh, the whole issue of uh, feeding, nutrition and all, there are specific partners that we have been wor working with. But let me not steal the thunder from the chair of the foundation and let's get Ambassador Susulu to elaborate on the kind of linkages. What is uh, needed, however, is how do you have a, let's call it a catalytic uh, mechanism that's going to galvanize everyone in the way that you've raised, Kathy, at pretty short notice and say, this is an emergency. As the term was used, uh, this crisis wasn't small. It was like a tsunami. How yeah. do we ensure that we during tsunamis, because we must also bear in mind that uh, we're also going to have crises around climate related matters. How do we handle that? And we always have that come uh, rains um, in parts of our country. So I'm, I'm sort of passing it on to my colleague who's been working on this. Yeah, that, uh, that's fine. Let me just try and see if Ambassador uh, Sisulu is back up on, on the line with us. Ambassador Sis uh, uh, Sisulu, I I'm not sure if you can hear me and if you've been able to reconnect, but uh, you're very much free to take up the issue of that relationship between the private sector, between civil society, between government, because one of the purposes of this conversation is to really say what can be done better? You know, what are the areas that need strengthening, uh, particularly for future crises? All right, I don't think that Ambassador Sisulu can actually hear me. So, uh, Kone, I'm going to come to you. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really the same issue, but I want you to frame it through the context of what you were saying, that it took funders quite a long time to turn around and say, um, okay, maybe we'll, the money we've given you, yes, you can redirect that towards um, food, or we'll try and get you more money. To, to put towards food. So Kathy, I mean, I think there's there's a there's an interesting shift that has happened um, in the world of philanthropy and um, you know just providing welfare for general uh, for general humanitarian purposes, where um, I think in recent times there has been a lot of talk around. Um, monitoring and evaluation, how do we measure the impact of the things that we do? And therefore, people have been less and less um, open to providing funding that can be given for things that are seen to be perishable or to be um, of short-term impact and so on. And however, it's very important that, um, you know, I think this crisis made us understand that those safety nets require maintaining. If you don't have an ability 
to feed yourself, you are not going to be able to take the children to school and um, you know, grow your infrastructure and so on. Section 27 of our constitution um, says that everyone has the right to have access to food and water. And we take that so for granted as something that is so basic. And yet, um, you know, we see that there are those parts of our communities that are so vulnerable that they require assistance um, for us to be able to do that. Now, as part of um, civil society, it then becomes important to also have partners that already are established, that you have relationships with, that you can then go to, you know, and, 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 and it's easier to speak to them to say, we need to quickly respond to this, we need to quickly respond to that. And for us, it was important to have that both on the donor side as well as on the community side, because the community-based organizations, um, you know, also needed to know that, yes, um, we are a, you know, organization that is working with pregnant mothers, but right now, what we really need to shift to do is to not only help them look after themselves while they are pregnant and get and making sure that they get the right nutrition and so on, but it's also getting them, um, you know, teaching them about what is going on, what the pandemic is all about, what do they need. And a lot of it, actually, um, food came out as a important preventative measure because to, to boost the immune systems, to make sure that people are appropriately and adequately nourished so that their own bodies can fight against the virus in the manner that they need to. And those that don't have that have a lower chance of, of, of being able to do that. And then of course, um, I think the last is how we help communities um, you know, build their own resilience. Um, food gardens are one of the ways that people can grow their own food. Um, recently, we saw a, a story in Pretoria where a local resident in Pretoria had planted food um, or cabbages outside of his yard in the kind of um, common municipal area outside of his yard and um, got into trouble with the law as a result of that. Some of, you know, cases like that um, should make us stand up and, and think, what are we responding to? What is important for us in making sure that we maintain um, um, streets that look in a particular way, or we actually enable our communities to be able to fend for themselves and be able to provide for themselves? And it actually, I think, sparked quite an, in, an interesting debate in terms of the importance of law and order while at the same time allowing communities and ordinary people to respond um, to challenges that they see around them. And food gardens certainly is one of the ways that brings nutritious, um, nutritious food and makes it available for everyone. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more with you on, on, on that one, Kone. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to be taking question and answers. If you're joining us uh, via the platform, of course, I see already some of uh, the questions have been marked. Uh, Ambassador Sisulu, whenever uh, you are logged on, just feel free just to shout and, and I'll give you an opportunity to weigh in on the conversation. I know they, that we're still having just a bit of difficulty um, with that with that connection to her, so let me let me begin by by looking at at, at this. At, oh, well, I guess it's more for comment than a question, and it's from Laurie Lake who says, while coordination is indeed needed, how do we achieve? Let me go back to it. How do we achieve this when individual systems broke down? Education child health services, DSD, none of these were functioning optimally. So, Kathy, Kathy, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Okay, I, I hope it will stay like that. <laughs> yes, I'm crossing both fingers. I'm, I'm, I'm fingers on both hands, rather. I'm yes. crossing fingers on both hands. <laughs> okay, right. if, I, if I may just... Uh, when I go, when I got when I lost the the connectivity, yes, uh, we were talking about uh, coordination, and I've heard, I've, I've been hearing actually the conversation. It's okay. unfortunate you couldn't hear me, but um, mm -hmm. the, the issue of coordination in a storm, 
it happened it has to happen on sunny days like today in Joburg that we get together and plan for a rainy day i mean this is such a cliche um the ra a rainy day but that's what we have to do um the experience uh, during the early days of COVID, where it wasn't even a breakdown. The education department, once COVID uh, hit and their responsibility is in schools, then the responsibility of, if you want, uh, health and welfare of the indigent shifted to social development. But social de development didn't have uh, the systems either. Uh, so I would like to say whether it's between government and business, business uh, government and civil society, we have to work on those uh, uh, connectivities and, and plans uh, today, much like the military almost would prepare for war. We, we have to, to be very clear uh, what we are preparing for, uh, for that, for that, for that reason. Thank you. And, and Ambassador Susulu, who, who should take the lead in that process? Because oftentimes you're talking about role players that have sometimes very different interests. You know, yes, there might be common interests in the, in the midst of a crisis, but on sunny days, everybody goes back to default mode or default position. So... Can yeah, I'd love to come in on that one as well, sure. but let's take I'm, Ambassador Sisulu first sure. and then I'll no come problem. in. No, no. So, so, so who do you think go should... Ahead. Go for it. I, I, I might be... I might be um, I, I, not, not, not radical, uh, but I, I, I would suggest that the office of uh, the president initiates a multi-sectoral uh, conversation and that will also include uh, the defense force because we can learn from them. They don't work with civil society, that's true, but they are always ready for war they can teach us how to be ready for a social disruption of the magnitude of um COVID. so i would put it in the in the office of of, of the president uh possibly to work with education social development defense defense force and and health So let me build okay. on that radicalism. And I want to place <laughs> something on the table around that. I think the first thing, and this is going a bit into history. Um, when South Africa first adopted the child support grant, it adopted it and it was based on a policy paper that was one that looked at the provision of a basket of services. This basket of services involved social development, health, education, public works. Um, it also had some of the other economic ministries involved. And our major focus at that particular point in time was uh, to look at a grant, a package, that was one along the lines of Bolsha Familia, which is a similar grant that you find both in Mexico as well as Brazil. So the intention was that the social sector ministers had to work together along with the economic cluster. And at that particular point in time, uh, the pivot was the then Ministry of Welfare or Social Development. One part of that grant progressed very fast, and it was, I think, to the advantage of the country. 
that was the child support grant. And that has served as a social safety net in terms mm -hmm. of a cash transfer. But the other parts didn't kick in because of a lack of collaboration and coordination mm -hmm. across government. So at a cabinet level, those ministers must come together. Putting it into the presidency is fine and good, but you do have the Ministry of Women and Children in the presidency, and that's supposed to kick in as well. So I think what we have seen is that systems have not functioned as collaboratively as we should. What we shouldn't do is build another layer without doing away with dysfunctional layers, because otherwise we're yeah. doing what normally happens in committees. Uh, we're in a committee, you say, okay, let's build another structure. But I think what we're talking about today is how do we ensure the functionality of structures in place? How do we ensure accountability? How do we ensure that it actually works? So for now, because it's still during a tsunami, so to speak, maybe the presidency should come in. But it's about time that those ministries and departments come into play as they should. And as we are looking at the self-critically, we must also acknowledge that there are probably little bits that work well. And probably as the private sector, and I'm being self-critical, we also don't coordinate as well as we should. Are all the FMCG companies coordinating across as FMCG companies? I think it's the first call to us. To civil society as well, is civil society coordinating as well as it should? And I think we then bring all parts together and we can then have the commander in chief there and we can have the army there. Over to you, Cathy. Uh, can thank I you for can something sure. on the army? Mm. Can I just say something on the army? I mean, it is, it is radical uh, 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 to bring that thought in, in terms of the expertise that the army has uh, with planning, uh, with, with control and discipline. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, during this crisis, uh, there was an attempt to, to bring in the army. So in all of this, what becomes important also is how you do it. You know, um, that, that multidisciplinary planning in making sure that everyone has a clear objective and what they bringing to the table instead of just saying the army must just come and and, and help us crowd control when maybe uh, you know there are other um, impacts that uh, that may come in um, i thought that 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 actually was a was a was a was an interesting was was an interesting point given the the the, the developments that we had seen but it certainly is a point that if well used can be of great value I'm 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 yes, interested I, by by I this agree. Yeah. May I may I just uh, explain yeah. the the I don't think the commander in chief must just command the army at any time. What I'm talking about is to work on the issue of the early warning and preparedness mm. uh, system. And the 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 army is well, supposed to be war, war ready. The defense force is supposed to be war ready. They are not trained to work with civilians, but they have the expertise on how do you prepare to take on an emergency? What are the things that you look for? And I'm talking about, yes, we are in the middle mm -hmm. now uh, of the tsunami, but I think in the lull, we have to then have the commander in chief because he has convening powers. He must call everyone and say, we've seen what has happened. This is not over yet. Put our heads together. What do we do to make sure that when the fourth wave and maybe the fifth wave, something else comes along, mm. are we ready? Mm. Uh, so no 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 it's not boots on the ground <laughs> it's not about boots on the ground it's about head can i come in on that one 
<laughs> sure, sure, and I it. think it's a wonderful suggestion. But I want to guard against uh, planning and coordination simply being seen to come from the military. I think, in essence, the center of government should be coordinating that. And uh, the center of government brings together all government departments and will draw on that aspect as required. So in terms of, in times of disaster, where Ambassador Sisulu is quite correct, in times of disaster, national disasters, sub-regional disasters and all, the army will be brought in as required. But I think first and foremost, as we come in to, uh, as we come into dealing with this crisis, we're saying that there's a need for better coordination across government. There's better co there's a need for better coordination between government, the private sector, and civil society, and there are structures. It looks like we've lost Dr. Geraldine there. Uh, hopefully, she'll be she'll be able to yes. reconnect with us soon. Okay, there we go. She's just come back into the room. Uh, Dr. Polly. Geraldine, you can continue. Yeah, that was just my finger moving off the over the keyboard. Too much enthusiasm around coding. <laughs> so, so I'm saying the coordination is. Yeah, I, th I think when they don't like what you're saying, <laughs> it turns you off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks like this. Uh, um, yeah, so so it's necessary for government to ensure that with the reality of potentially recurring crises, and we know that there's potentially a level uh, four coming, let's prepare for that. And mm. let's bring only bring the army in if we feel that it's something that cannot be handled mm. in the normal course of things, because our normal mm. course should see better coordination around the government departments with whom we struggled. I think if I go back to the specific that was raised by um, Ambassador Susulu earlier, as well as Kone, Gugushe. Yeah, Kathy, can you I mean, hear me? Yes. Yes, we can, Ambassador Susulu. Okay. Uh, I think the 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 either internet or something is unstable. Um, okay. But I think what we are all agreeing is that uh, we need to initiate a process of collaboration mm. for rainy days mm. while we have the sun. Whether that rainy day is day zero, as in Cape Town, or drought in five of our nine um, provinces, or indeed COVID. I was simply suggesting the president because he has convening powers. Part of the difficulty is that while uh, ministries have uh, you know, responsibilities, they are equal. And who amongst them decides then uh, to call an interministerial uh, meeting except the president? Mm. So that, that's why I'm suggesting that the president calls it and then we, all of us around the table, take it from there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Okay, Geraldine, let me give you a chance. Oh, is she back? Yes, yes, she's back on. She's back on. Let me let me give you a chance to, to also wrap up your thoughts and, and I'll come then to you, Kone. Yeah. Um, I think the the thought you we had heard was that there's a need for the planning function to operate better. Interministerial committees can be convened uh, in addition to the president or the deputy president by a lead minister as well. So that's something that can be done. 
I um, had concluded. You can't hear? Can you hear, Kathy? Yes, I Kathy, can. Can you hear? Yes, okay. I can. Yes. Yes. So I'm saying that very clearly. This is something that can be done, and I think we'll take it forward in that. All right. All right. I'll I'll give you a moment. <laughs> I'll give you a moment to 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 attend to her. Uh, Kone, you can come in now. Uh, thank you, thank you, Geraldine. Let's let's. I think let's commend uh, Granny Geraldine over there <laughs> in terms of multitasking. <laughs> um, but I really, I, I mean, I agree with the points that have been made with regards to the need um, for interministerial um, coordination and um, um, you know, kind of planning together and and operationalization of that. Um, because some of these things, you want them by the time a crisis hits, um, to already be working and 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 be well oiled. Um, civil society of, also has a very important role to play, and we must commend the efforts that were done with regards to the setting up of the solidarity fund that really acted as a pool um, of of funds, as well as uh, you know, um, and providing access. Uh, to those funds for various um, for various elements um, of response, including a uh, response for humanitarian efforts. Um, and I think it's it, it becomes important um, as civil society, as private sector, as everyone to also understand that there are there are spaces where we can have our own expertise and work by ourselves uh, in advancing the objectives that we have. But there certainly are spaces where we need to collaborate and we need to put aside that kind of mindset of um, competing and separate development and work together in advancing in advancing that cause. Um, the way that we work um, as the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, because we are such a small organization, but we've got ambitions of having a wider reach, is we work with community-based organizations across the country. And this then allows us to um, you know, reach communities where they are. And with this, it means that we need to make sure that our objectives are in tandem and coordinated with the objectives of each of those community-based organizations. And this is something that I think as a country we need, we need to do better in. We need to find spaces of collaboration. We need to find areas where um, we don't want to develop um, individually and separately, but the collective actually gets us to achieve much more sustainable results, much more better impact. And, and we, we've got, you know, differing views from the delegates, the delegates who are part of uh, this webinar this afternoon in terms of, you know, what is then the best way forward. Some are suggesting, yes, perhaps a national food that's from Lorry Lake, a national food and nutrition security council driving intersectoral collaboration in the presidency led by the deputy president how do we ensure that this is established as a matter of urgency and how do we ensure that children are prioritized within the the national strategy uh, if i may i think the children are prioritized except that they are prioritized on their own, uh, separate from their families. The child grant is, I think, one of the more successful programs targeting children through their caregivers, their mothers, uh, or any uh, members of, of, of the family that are giving care. But the particular, how, particular thing about uh, children and hunger, as I said in the beginning, they are not hungry alone. alone. Mm -hmm. So when there is no access to food, in fact, even the social grant doesn't uh, provide them with the nutrition and the food they need. I agree. 
uh, I think before we establish a a um, council, let's have a conversation about um, what needs to be done right now and, and give then the council a framework when it gets formed uh, of what needs to happen, especially around children. The, so the one thing that we didn't talk about was is the fact that uh, children's nutrition or malnutrition begins from conception. The first thousand days mm. are supposed to be the most critical. So if the pregnant teenage mother uh, is malnourished, they are going to give birth to an underweight child who already has a major disadvantage uh, because they will grow up slow, slower and they will be more stunted and their education and health future is going to be uh, uh, impacted. The preschool or grade uh, whatever, the, the, the before school programs, well and good. But by the time the child is three years old, if the child is malnourished, it's very difficult to reverse um, those impacts. So I, I, I would suggest that urgently, the president calls um, in November, whenever a, 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 a summit in, in Indaba on food security, hunger, um, and, and uh, or food insecurity and hunger among children. And so Ambassador, yeah. And Ambassador Sisulu, what happens in the absence of that? So I hear a lot of the planning and, and the collaboration. I'll come to you now, Dr. Geraldine. A lot of the planning and the collaboration, the suggestions are centered on government's involvement. Mm -hmm. Is that the only way that this can be done in terms of bringing the, the, the different role players together? Um, there is no institution mm. that has a bigger footprint than mm. government. Mm. And, <clears throat> and, and government has to make use of that advantage. And we, as citizens, have to make sure that government uses that footprint. We don't leave it up to them. Uh, there was a question earlier about business. You know, if you take the ba banking sector, I know for a fact that they have an emergency response program, how to move money around during emergencies. So the banks don't run out of money. So there is a lot that we can even learn from, the, from there. But somebody who has the authority, who has the, has to call that first meeting. Okay. The children are not going to march, unfortunately. Um, but I, yeah, I think government has to pull us together and then we take it from there. Dr. Gerald Deep. Thank you. Uh, on a few of the issues that have been raised, and I think there's been very important points raised. It's a pity that our networks have been a bit uh, problematic. So on a few issues, a government has had a national command center around COVID. If we are saying this crisis arises out of COVID, they should simply pull that into play and get the ministries and departments that are directly responsible for uh, facilitating better collaboration, they must come together and do it. I'm a bit concerned about too many structures. And as I said earlier, it's not helpful if you put in place yet another structure and you don't disable dysfunctional structures. So we should either get the structures to function well or replace them with a different structure. So my call would be there is 
a uh, social cluster, that cluster must come into uh, operation around this. And I think that there is a fair amount of work that has been done. And we, what we've seen is the absence of optimal coordination, collaboration and partnership. And I think Praveena Naidu talks about this in the chat. And, and one couldn't help but agree with that. I'd also secondly want to agree with a point uh, that was made and a point that came through in the discussion that we're not arguing for the army to lead a response to child nutrition. That is not their mandate and we would not want that to happen. We also know that even in the positive role that the army plays, there is a role and space for them. They only can come into play during extreme crises and disasters. There are sufficient other arms of government that should function in order to take this forward. The third point that I'd like to raise, and I agree fully with uh, Ambassador Susulu on this particular point, and that's that it is the responsibility of government and the public sector as a whole based on the budget that they have to respond to the reality of child hunger and today we are talking about child hunger and child nutrition there are larger issues around hunger that we link back to the issues of unemployment, inequality, and all that. But uh, with respect to the issue of nutrition and hunger, we would want to ensure appropriate responses. And we say that the private sector also needs to come into play and make that happen, as does civil society. Laurie's further point, and a point that has come through various of the other questions is, Make sure that whatever the intervention is, that it cuts across all levels of government and in particular local government, because at the end of the day, that is where the communities live. Even though for communities, for you and I, government is government, it doesn't matter what level. It's the responsibility of government to ensure that national, provincial and local government comes into play and they facilitate partnerships. So emphasizing the point that it's not about new and more structures, it's about ensuring effective functioning of structures and greater accountability of, the, of those structures. And finally, ourselves, as the private sector must play our role to optimally ensure that we make a contribution. Our contribution is to ensure that we contribute towards the growth of the economy. We need to play a role in employment as far as possible. We need to grow what we are doing, but above all, we also have a great social responsibility role. And, and from that point of view, we have in Tiger Brands put in place a foundation that's working very well. And we have a fighter at the head of, of, of the foundation itself. And, and I think if one looks at the leadership and governance of the company, ours is to ensure that not only do we contribute pos positively towards nutrition and specifically child nutrition in this country, but we also ensure that this quality in the products that we produce and deliver, and we find ourselves accountable both to the customer and to larger society. And this is not restricted to South Africa only, but across the African continent where we have a footprint. Thank you, and over to you. Thank, thank you so much for that. Uh, Kone, I'm going to give you a chance to, to come in, and I'm going to also ask you that as you make the comments, if you can also include in it your concluding remarks on, on this topic. Um, thank you, Kathy. You know, um, <clears throat> as, I'm, as I've been listening to the conversation unfold, uh, one, um, two things um, um, came to my mind um, 
and I think one of them was raised in the in the chat earlier relating to the level of food inflation that we saw um, as a result of um, the crisis that um, uh, that we're in. And then the second one is, you know, how we promote appropriate education with regards to what good nutrition is. So as we try to combat hunger, how do we enable our communities to understand what it means to provide good nutrition for themselves and for their children? Because, you know, part of the fight that we've had to have um, in this particular health crisis is making sure that we actually boost and make sure that our immune systems are, are strong. And, you know, that starts from, you know, um, Ambassador Suzulu mentioned it, from as, as early as when the mother is pregnant, getting good nutrition. So it's not just about eating, but it's also about eating the right nutritious foods. And there's a lot that can be done to unburden our health system from unnecessary um, health crises that uh, are as a result of bad nutrition and, you know, uh, the bad impacts of, of food. So two things for me, you know, also looking at education as well as food inflation that also then makes food unattainable, unaffordable um, for, for those vulnerable people. And, and the issue of the cost of food is such an important one, Connie. Uh, the, the Peter Marisberg group that tracks the price of food, uh, of the mm. basic food basket, of course, has been, uh, you know, marching, has been marking quite stark increases in, mm. in the cost of food, which again has contributed uh, to the scale of the problem that we're seeing. Ambassador mm. Susulu, I'll, I'll, I'm going to come and give you an opportunity perhaps to also give us your concluding remarks. Ambassador Susulu? Okay, I, I think we may have lost her on that line. So, uh, Dr. Geraldine, that means then that you have the final word for the conversation today. <laughs> um, thank you very much again uh, for this opportunity. I've noted uh, a comment by, I think it's Shahida Omar, who makes a pertinent point that children are always hardest hit by any uh, crisis and there's a need uh, uh, and there needs to be a structure to address children's rights and needs and a structure that uh, is accountable. It goes back to a point that I have made in the opening where I've indicated that children may not necessarily be the face of uh, both the COVID pandemic, the face of hunger and so on, but they risk being amongst the, its biggest victims. And we have a responsibility as society to respond in a coordinated way. It's not the problem of the child I had on my lap earlier and I want mm -hmm. to thank everyone for accommodating that. Or the child who's not in a similar situation, who's living in an informal settlement in Alexander, or the child who lives in Bochum in the Northern Cape. It's not the problem of those children that we haven't coordinated ourselves. We must now, more than at any other time, ensure that we coordinate the structures that are there in uh, society to function better. We must ensure that we deal with the issues of nutrition appropriately and responsibly. We must ensure that we can, without fear or favor, um, carry ourselves in such a way that our contribution within the public sector, private sector, or civil society, when future generations look back at this period, they will say the 2020-2021 crisis was not lost. 
it was one where those who were there at the time learned out of that crisis and created an opportunity out of it. They brought together the greatest players in industry, the greatest players in civil society, the smallest players in community, and always considered the children because the public sector ensured that it was taken forward in a coordinated way. Thank you very much uh, for co-convening us this afternoon, uh, Cathy. And, and, and thanks to Kone and to Ambassador Sisulu as well. No, no problem at all. Uh, let me thank you. Uh, I, I think, you know, we've had to soldier through uh, this conversation, but the commitment is absolutely notable. And this conversation hopefully will not be the last of it because who then takes the suggestion, uh, Dr. Geraldine, to the presidency? about what has come out of uh, this particular conversation and how best to coordinate and to collaborate uh, to prevent you know the, the scale and the impact of this existing uh, pandemic that we're in but also future crises that uh, this country is is likely to face uh, so thank you all so much especially uh, to the guests that have been part of this conversation as well. It's been a pleasure being in your company. I just want to try and give you the quick results from uh, the polls that we have been running from this afternoon. Of course, uh, we were running several polls. And let me just give you what the results of those polls are. So uh, the first one that we asked people to comment on was, are children more vulnerable in disasters and crises? And uh, that was an obvious one, 100% of the respondents there said yes. Uh, moving on to the second panel, are children more, oh, or actually, so the result, the updated result of that first one, are children more vulnerable in disasters and crises? It's 96% yes, and 3% of people being unsure of, of whether they're actually vulnerable. The second poll we ran was, um, do you think that it is important for us to have a conversation about food as a critical rights issue for children during a disaster. And of course, all of uh, the respondents to that said yes. So uh, let me thank you all for being part of uh, this conversation. Uh, Kone, it's been a pleasure. Ambassador Sisulu, thank you for soldiering on. I know you've been affected by the load shedding as well, uh, but you've really, uh, your commitment to having this conversation ha has been committed. I would have given up at the second try, but you know, you, you never stopped trying and, and that's what matters the most. And uh, Dr. Geraldine, you're going to have to teach me how you put a baby to, to sleep so quickly. Uh, I don't know if it's practice or magic hands, whichever one of the two, it's working really well for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Kathy. <laughs> we'll have an offline coffee on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. Thank you all so much for being Thank part you. of the conversation. Thank Tiger you. Brands together with the Mail and Guardian. That's where we we'll leave it then for today. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kone. Thank you. Thanks.